Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Peace be upon us. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chuachi Summit 2022 and Chuachi Fifth Anniversary. We are grateful to be able to hold this event annually. And this year, we go with the spirit of Torch Digital Age and Post Pandemic, Rebound, Connect, and Grow. My name is Rebecca Santi, the director and lead translator of Artimur and secretary of Chuachi, and I will be the moderator of the first half session of today's event. So before we start, uh, we would like to remind you that this event is recorded and you also can watch this event through live YouTube. And we have this big one that will be collated later on. So we will encourage all the audience to click on the link and you can post your photo and send it to us. So first of all, we would like to thank Kuting University Alumni Chapter Indonesia or Chuachi for hosting and organizing this webinar for all of us. And we warmly welcome our participants today that we believe come from all over Indonesia and beyond. What a special delight to have you all with us this Saturday morning. And allow me to extend my warmest welcome to our distinguished guests and or their rep representative today. The first is Her Excellency Penny Williams, PFM, the Ambassador to Indonesia, Head of Mission, Australian Embassy Jakarta, Australian Embassy in Jakarta, and Second, Ibu Krista Denston, Commissioner of WA Trade and Investment Office Jakarta and Bapak Sandi Yudhistira, the Education and Training Business Development Manager, Government of Western Australia Office in Jakarta. Three, Professor Samuel Loni, the Pro Vice Chancellor and President of Curtin Malaysia. Uh, four, Ms. Jessica Fulin, Alumni and Community Relations Coordinator. Ibu Wahyu Mukti Kusumanikas, the Deputy De Program Director for Inclusion and Outcomes, Australia Awards in Indonesia. Dr. Joseph Ratna, the first president of Chuachi, 2017 to 20, 2019. And also our guest speakers for professional development. The first is Dr. Sporker, the senior lecturer at School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry, Curtin University, Perth, Western Australia. And the second speaker is Mr. Tubagus Solihudin, PhD, from the Center of Climate and Atmospheric Research, National Agency for Research and Innovation, or BRIN. We also welcome the Curtin, Curtin Alumni Chapter President, Paul Tham. He's the president of uh, Singapore Chapter and also from the uh, Quick Indonesia, Queensland University of Technology in Indonesia community. So before we start uh, the Church's Summit, we will take a moment to sing the Indonesian Indonesian National Anthem, Indonesia Raya. Now we are going to pray, to take a moment to pray according to our respective faith. So everyone in all the audience, we will pray together. Let's pray. 
Amen. Thank you, everyone. And now we will commence the Chachi Summit 2022 with a series of events as follows. The first, we will have professional development sessions with two speakers, Dr. Thor Kerr and Bapak Tubagus Salahuddin, PhD. And then we will have a three minute business teaching, followed by the annual general meeting. And at last but not least, we will have fun activity. It will be our pleasure to have your audience to enjoy the whole event that we have prepared today. Now we will begin uh, to listen to some opening remarks from our distinguished guests. Some of the guests uh, cannot make it today to our events, but then they have been very generous to pre-recorded some videos for us to watch. So first of all, we will have the opening remarks from our very own Chelsea president, Ms. Heriberto Srintobi Wubo, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mbak Beka. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. All of us, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Rahayu, and Salam Kebajikan. Uh, good morning, Ibu and Bapak and all colleagues. I hope all of you are in good health always. On behalf of Chuachi Committee, Kertin University Alumni Chapter Indonesia Committee, we would like to thank for joining us today in this uh, Chuachi Summit 2022 webinar. Today, we also celebrated our uh, fifth anniversary First of all, let me greet the distinguished guests, uh, Her Excellency Penny Williams, PSM, the Ambassador to Indonesia, Head of Mission, Australian Embassy Jakarta, Ibu Krista Dunstan, Commissioner of WA Trade and Investment Office Jakarta, and Pak Sandi Yudhistira, the Education and Training Business Development Manager, Government of Western Australia Office in Jakarta, Ibu Tias, Ibu Wahyu Mukti Kusumani Tias, the Deputy Program Director for Inclusion and Outcomes, Australia Outed Indonesia. Good morning, Bu Tias. Pak Sandi, Professor Simon Leonik, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and President of Kertin Malaysia, uh, Ms. Jessica Fulin, Alumni and Community Relation Coordinator, also Bu, jo Bu Josephine Ratna, and the first President of Chuachi 27-2019, selamat pagi Bu Jo, uh, also our mentor, and also uh, Pak Tor, Dr. Torker, the Senior Lecturer at School of Media, Red Art and Social and Theory, uh, Kertin University, Pak Western Australia, and also Pak Tubagus Solihudin, PhD, from uh, Center for Climate and Atmospheric Research, National Agency for Research and Innovation. Also Patricia Kelly, the representative from, uh, for Indonesia for uh, of the University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Also the Chuachi committee member, also all Chuachi member, and also all Phil uh, College to join us today this morning. My name is Harry. On behalf of Chuachi mem uh, committee, we would like to thanks uh, for joining us today. Uh, so we will celebrate the fifth anniversary. The Curtin University Alumni Chapter Indonesia or Chuachi offers to promote graduates upright in and commitment to Curtin University. We uh, it is uh, uh, it was launched in September 2017. Chuachi is run by a large committee of passionate Curtin Indonesian graduates committed to holding events, maintaining communication, and providing support services and a range of other opportunities to Curtin alumni in Indonesia and beyond. Committed to facilitate a network of alumni across Indonesia, Perth, Western Australia, and beyond. Uh, Chuachi regularly holds various activities to provide alumni with opportunities to share their knowledge, experiences, and skills in their professional fields with other alumni and communities. Chuachi National and International Network allows the initiation, development, and reinforcement of professional linkages and partnership between Curtin Alumni Asia chapters in other countries, Curtin University, and other relevant institutions such as Australia Global Alumni Indonesia, WA Government Office Indonesia, Australian Embassy, uh, etc. And it all benefits Swatch member to get connected with fellow alumni across a discipline and profession, organization, and institution, and geographic areas in order to share good practice and create opportunities for collaboration. All in all, Chuachi also showcases Curtin University's excellence as global provider of high quality education and research through their alumni. Chuachi uh, conducts uh, an annual event uh, in, uh, in 2018, Chuachi held its first annual general meeting and also professional development in Surabaya, uh, led by Bu Jun Hevin. Uh, in 2019, Chuachi held uh, Chuachi Summit 4.0 in Jakarta. In 2020, Chuachi held Chuachi Summit 2020 uh, through online after the pandemic. And since April 2020, we have we also conducted more than 20 webinars with various topics and guest speakers with a total around 100 and, uh, 1,500 participants join our webinar. We also invite not only for alumni, but also it open for public. 
We also collaborated with Australia Global Alumni in Indonesia Networks. Thank you, Budias and team. Captain alumni chapter from Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and other alumni chapters, including Queensland University of Technology Institute uh, Indonesia Community, or QUIC. Also, Government of Western Australia Office, Jakarta, in Jakarta, etc. This year, as part of our fifth anniversary and our responses to the new normal after the COVID-19 situation, we, uh, we will highlight the efforts made in the recovery period through Chuati Summit 2022 with them uh, towards digital as and in the post pandemy What's special in Chuati is that we have every year we have this uh, tagline special uh, for our anniversary that can be a reminder for the alumni and also motivation for us. In 2018, we have sharing and caring. 2019, we have collaboration and inspiration. 2020, we have innovation and impact. 2021, we have empower and thrive. And this year, we have rebound, connect, and grow. We hope that the alumni and also all, not only alumni, but all of us can prepare for the rebound after the COVID-19 COVID pandemic crisis. Also, we can keep connected in this digital era and also grow together. I would like to thank particularly for our amazing uh, guest speaker today, uh, Pak Torger, Dr. Torger from Pertin University and also Pak Tobago Solyudin. Thank you for, uh, I hope, yeah, I hope we can get inspired from uh, your, your presentation. And thank you for all the Chochi uh, committee and all the Chochi members that have been prepared for this event. Without you all, there will be no Chochi Summit today. I hope you can enjoy the Chochi Summit 22 and get inspired. Thank you, Mbak for uh, being moderator for this professional development. Before that, I will show you the, our Chochi journey through our video. Let me play the Chochi journey from 2017 to 2022. Thank you, Bujay, for initiate, initiate this uh, chapter.
Yes, we have so many activities. We will invite you to join our activities in the next future. Please uh, follow our social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We will uh, uh, we will inform the, the activities in the, the future through this media, uh, social media. And it's not for alumni, but it's for all of us that can join the event to get inspired and have fun in this with Chuachi. Thank you, Mabeka. Back to you. Thank you, Mas Heri. Yeah, I feel so a bit emotional looking at all the journey that Chachi has since the beginning, since the birth, until it's growing and developing until up until today. And I believe Chachi has been a very safe space for all its members to develop, to grow, and to connect, and especially to inspire one another. Thank you so much, Mas Heri. And now we are going to have the second um, opening remarks. Let's welcome with me Ibu Wahyu Mukti Kusumanintias from Australia Global Alumni in Indonesia. Ibu Tias, are you here with us? Awesome. Hello, Bu. How are you? Hi. Good morning. Morning, Bu. So happy yeah, to have you morning. here. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Good morning, and thank you uh, to all distinguished speakers guest and alumni chapter uh, president, uh, the organizers of this event, and good morning, Bapak, Ibu, and teman-teman sekalian. Uh, I just want to check before I start, can everyone hear me well? Yes. Yes, yeah. okay, good. Uh, thank you once again, and first of all, I'm delighted to speak on behalf of Australia What's in Indonesia, and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, it's a great honor to uh, virtually reconnect with uh, Curtin alumni and uh, distinguished guests here this morning. Uh, so this is perhaps the 23rd uh, Curtin University related event that Australia Awards in Indonesia have been involved since 2017. Um, I note uh, the attendance of uh, Curtin alumni from all over and perhaps also outside Indonesia too. Um, some of you are alumni who may have benefited from Australian government scholarship programs. Some of you might have paid your own way to study in Australia or with support from uh, your government scholarship. Um, and irrespective of uh, your funding source for your educational experience, your presence at today's virtual event uh, reaffirmed your enthusiasm to stay connected and desire to contribute positively to the Australian alumni community. So as a program, we uh, recognize the lasting powerful impact of Australian alumni connections. Um, considerable efforts are being made to enhance our engagement with a broader, more inclusive and stronger Australian uh, uh, alumni community who are proud to maintain their connection with Australia and their alma mater. I think we all agree that studying in Australia has given us an opportunity to experience world leading institutions and learn from globally recognized experts such as Dr. Thor Kerr, uh, who are here with us today. And Australia program has witnessed you know, how the knowledge, experience, network and skills that alumni gain from Australian universities have opened the doors and strengthened the opportunity for alumni to become an agent of change. Uh, in this context, uh, an agent of change is uh, somebody who sees the problem in their community, no matter large or small, uh, and does something to act for substantial uh, change to contribute to Indonesia's development. Um, in our case, this is evidence from 10 Curtin alumni from Indonesia who led impactful uh, projects under our alumni grant scheme program. Uh, through the grants projects, they have successfully applied the knowledge, experience, skills within the organizations and communities and leveraged their strength and network uh, in their professional context. We recorded around 370 Indonesian alumni graduated from Curitin University, uh, many of whom uh, have long as, and distinguished career and highly recognized nationally or globally for their contributions in their professional context. To name a few, um, are 
Professor Dr. Marsudi Wahyukiswara, who is an advisor board, advisory board member of National Research and Innovation Agency. We have Dr. Ahmad Agusatiawan. Uh, he is uh, the expert staff to the President of Indonesia. Professor Dr. Muhammad Ashari. Uh, he's the Rector of Institute Technology, 10 November. Uh, also, Professor Dr. Apriana Toding, uh, who is the Chairperson of the Research and Community Service at Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Paulus in Makassar. And she's also the youngest women professor in Eastern Indonesia. Uh, other alumni, uh, prominent alumni names like, uh, you know, we have here Bapak Tubagus and Ibu Irma Irshad um, are, you know, uh, among those, uh, you know, prominent and influential alumni uh, from Curtin University. So in addition to an agent of change, uh, alumni can serve as a dynamic resource especially when it comes to attracting talents and branding of Australian universities. Uh, more importantly, uh, as alumni, you were also a resource that we may have not been fully harnessed. And that is what today's event hosted by Curtin University is all about. Uh, and I'm glad that we are gathered here virtually. And I hope that uh, this event will be a catalyst for building a stronger professional, cultural, and social network among alumni and between you and your institution. So on behalf of Australia Awards in Indonesia, I'd like to express our heartfelt thanks to Curtin University for graciously hosting this alumni event. And to everyone in the Zoom, I trust that you will have a productive and successful discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibu Ties, uh, for the warm and really beautiful remarks for us. And third of all, we also have here with us uh, Bapak Sandi, Bapak Sandi Yudhistila, uh, from Education and Training Business Development Manager, um, Government Office in Australia, Office in Jakarta. Bapak Sandi, hello Pak Sandi, how are you? Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, Ms. Rebecca, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. Uh, I would like to represent Ms. Krista Dunstan. Uh, she has forwarded her apologies for not being able to participate with us this morning, but she prepared an opening remark that I will help convey here verbatim. So Her Excellency Penny Williams, Ambassador to Indonesia, Head of Mission Australia Embassy Jakarta, Professor Simon Lunick, Pro, Pro Vice Chancellor and President of Curtin Malaysia, Mr. Sean Welburn Wood, Dean ASEAN Curtin University. Ms. Jessica Fullin, team leader, alumni and community relations of Curtin University. Uh, Ibu Wahyu Mukti Kusumaning Tias from Australia Global Alumni, Australia Works Indonesia. Dr. Josephine Ratna, the first president of Chuachi and senior advisor of Chuachi. Ibu Patricia Kelly, in-country recruitment executive of Curtin University of Indonesia. Bapak Heribertus Rinto Wibowo, President of Chuachi, uh, together with the Chuachi Committee and Chuachi members that has done a wonderful job in organizing this summit. Representatives from Queensland University of Technology, Indonesian community, and the Australia Alumni Association. Our esteemed guest speakers, Mr. Tubagus Solihuddin, PhD, and Dr. Thor Kerr, as well as all friends, great members of Chuachi community. Good morning. The government of Western Australia recently released the first edition of the Western Australia, It's Like No Other magazine. It encapsulates our stories from the state down under, stories that describe our journey so far where we started Diversify WA in 2019 with a bold vision to grow and diversify the state economy, as well as to create jobs and secure our future. Our state is blessed with abundant minerals and resources, but WA is emerging as much more than a mining state. Together, we nurtured opportunities for sectors of importance to Western Australia, such as international education, tourism and creative industries, agricultural technology, defense technology, health and medical technology, renewable energy and primary industries. 
in the magazine, we show how we reinforce the core principles in improving business and consumer confidence through launching WA Recovery Plan in 2020, which was tested heavily by the COVID-19 pandemic. And now our Reconnect WA package is helping Western Australia safely re-engage with the world. We tell stories about our approach to deliver tourism strategy that backs investment in local businesses and helps to generate jobs in a thriving visitor economy. We describe how Western Australian companies are adapting drone technology for the defense sector and built infrastructures overseas to share the knowledge with the world. We detail the development of our health and medical life sciences sector with one being that WA will host the 2022 Oz Biotech Conference in October. We also show how we are gearing up to welcome future Curtin University alumni from Indonesia and other parts of the world to study and live in Western Australia where they will be prepared to become the future members of global society. We encourage you to read all our stories so that you can be inspired as we will after learning about your stories today throughout this summit. Gatherings such as this Chuachi Summit provide an avenue for bright minds across disciplines to share knowledge and build networks, which are the key elements that form the very foundation towards strong and resilient growth. The government of Western Australia wants to be part of the engagements, to listen and provide meaningful support, and to celebrate together in each success that we have to change the future for the better. Curtin University's alumni consist of vibrant and active individuals, and the government of Western Australia acknowledge that Curtin University contributes vastly in the development of our state. We enjoy engaging with Chuachi's community members. We have the privilege to collaborate with members working with the government of Indonesia, higher education institutions, curriculum standard authority, research agencies, tourism, and we are happy to continue and expand the engagement in the future. Indonesia is a dear friend to Western Australia. We share many priority sectors and complement capabilities. One of our active engagements is the 30 year sister state relationship with East Jaffa, with Western Australia East Jaffa University's consortium as one of the core collaborations. With Curtin University at the forefront, let's develop further connections with our colleagues with the goal of achieving success together. Last but not least, happy fifth anniversary for Chuachi. This is the perfect time to reflect on what we have achieved together so far and discuss what we can innovate together next. Let us all seize the opportunity to provide for us today to rebound, reconnect and grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bapak Sandy from the government office in Australia, office in Jakarta. Indeed, it has been a privilege to have this relationship established between Indonesia and also Western Australian government. So now for four or three, three of our distinguished guests cannot make it to today's event, but they have been very generous to send us the pre-recorded video. So the first two will come from Ms. Jessica Pullin, the alumni and community relations coordinator of Curtin University. And the second of all is from Professor Simon Loni, the Provost Chancellor and President of Curtin Malaysia. So Thomas Harry, the floor is yours to play the recorded video. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jess and I'm the team leader of the Curtin's Alumni and Community Relations team here in Perth. Thank you so much for inviting me today to speak at today's Tarachi Summit, Rebound, Connect and Grow. And congratulations Tarachi on celebrating your fifth anniversary. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Kerr and Mr. Solihudin from Curtin for their support and being the guest speakers today. And a special shout out to Rebecca Santi for being the moderator. Today's topics look absolutely fantastic and no doubt everyone will leave with key takeaways. Welcome to distinguished guests and our wonderful alumni. Tarachi always do such a superb job in bringing and connecting everyone across the world in all their activities. 
So to Harry and the team, congratulations and well done on putting together another very impressive summit online. Tara Makasi, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Stay healthy, stay safe, and have a fantastic day. Thanks everyone, bye. Good morning everyone. My name is Professor Simon Leinig, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Curtin, Malaysia. I'm really pleased that Chuachi uh, continues to grow, and I believe this is the fifth year of having a summit. Your theme is towards the digital age and the post-pandemic period, and looking at rebounding, something that we're all facing at the moment. Our campus here in Sarawak only opened again fully uh, in January this year, and it's taken most of the year to get all the students back here, all of the activity happening, and go into a truly post-pandemic mode. I hope today that all of your guest speakers, including I saw Dr. Thor from, from Curtin, Australia, who will be speaking to you, uh, representatives of the Australian Embassy, uh, West Australian Trade Office, and, and other officials who will be attending this event, will provide a, a great founding for all of your discussions today. Curtin Malaysia continues to support our Indonesian alumni, but also new Indonesian students who are joining us all of the time. In fact, Indonesia continues to be one of our growing markets. So we're hoping to have lots and lots of Indonesian graduates through Curtin Malaysia over the coming years. To Pak Hari and all of the committee of Chuachi, I wish you all the best today. It's fabulous the amount of work that's gone in uh, to your uh, events over the years and a credit to all of you, including the past presidents uh, and officials who I'm sure are joining you uh, at this particular event. I wish you all the best today. Enjoy the, uh, enjoy the discussions and I look forward to hearing the outcomes of a fantastic event, Chihuahua 2022. Thank you. Thank you to Ms. Jessica Fulin and also Professor Simon Lund for the opening remarks. And at last, but not least, we have Her Excellency Penny Williams, PSM, the Ambassador to Indonesia, Head of Mission Australian Embassy Jakarta, that will deliver her opening speech. Good morning. Selamat pagi. I'm glad to be speaking with you all today as we come together to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Curtin University Alumni Chapter Indonesia, also known as Chuachi. I'm so pleased that despite the challenges we've all faced during this global pandemic, we have maintained our connections with one another and are able to come together for this very special event. Today's event is important in many ways. With the spirit of rebound, connect and grow, Chuachi supports a network of like-minded graduates to connect and discuss current issues such as the digital age and post-pandemic recovery. Through this, alumni are able to come together to establish or renew friendships and acquaintances and foster a sense of community among Curtin University alumni. I understand how it feels to connect with a host country. As many of you are aware, I live, lived and studied in Indonesia as an exchange student during my high school days. I lived with a host family in Menteng and studied at SMA Satu PSKD Jakarta. My time in Indonesia on exchange helped shape my career and forge a lifelong bond and connection with Indonesia, its culture and its people. Our alumni are a remarkable group with a diverse set of skills and representing a range of professional backgrounds from senior positions within government to leaders in industry and commerce. All of you are at the forefront of ensuring Indonesia's future growth and prosperity. Australia is proud of its alumni. We want to build positive and lasting relationships with you, as well as champion your contributions to Indonesia and the world. I understand that there will be professional development sessions held later today, as well as your annual meeting and other fun activities. You'll hear a range of ideas and perspectives throughout today that I hope will benefit you during your time studying in Australia and on your return to Indonesia. I very much hope that over the coming year, more in-person activities will be possible and I'll have the opportunity as well to meet many more alumni face to face. I look forward to seeing the power of this joint alumni resource, the large numbers of alumni between Australia and Indonesia. I hope that you look back fondly on your time in Australia and the bonds you forge. 
I urge you to be proud of your Australian education and continue to maintain ties with your institutions and Australia as you're clearly doing today. I'd like to thank Chuachi for hosting today's event and congratulate the Association on its fifth anniversary. Terima kasih. Okay. Thank you so much for Her Excellency Penny Williams, PSM, for the opening remarks. So that will be all for the uh, introductory part of this session. And we are going to move on to the professional development. And I would like to um, let the audience know that the professional development session will be delivered in English, whereas the rest of the sessions of today's event will be in Bahasa Indonesia. So before we begin the professional development session, I would like to invite all the audience for a group photo. So please, uh, Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, kindly open up your camera. And if you have installed the background, uh, Zoom background, that will be fantastic. And we will have our group photo together. Okay. So Maseri, what kind of hand sign should we make like this or like this? C, C for Chuachi. C then. for Chuachi. Okay. Sure. All right. So Bapak Ibu, you kindly make this sign. So it's a C for Chuachi. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So Maseri, could you please own my right hand, anyone? Oh, it's good. Sure. Okay. Okay. My right hand back up, yeah. One and two and three cheese. Okay, wait. Okay, okay we have more. the second page. One more, yes, second page. Okay, hold. One and two and three. Four. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, ready. Okay, thank you so much, Akari. All right, so Bapak Ibu, let's get started with our professional development session. So we have two wonderful um, speakers. The first is Dr. Thorker from Kirk University, and the second is Bapak Tubagus Solihudin, PhD from Brin. So we will begin with Thorker. Uh, you're up first. <laughs> so allow me to read the CV, the short CV from Thor. Thor is the currently he is the senior lecturer of Kirk University from School of Media, Creative Arts, and Social Inquiry. He researches social imaginaries of infrastructure on the eastern rim of the Indian Ocean and coordinates the Master of Arts program at Kirkland University. His research has contributed to new knowledge of uh, media representation, human rights, indigenous people's rights, impacts of infrastructure projects, and green built environments. He is also one of the on National Council of NTU and has served on Kirkland uh, Kirk University's academic board and has been an honorary senior fellow at the University of Melbourne and a visiting fellow at the Universitas Erlanga. So besides project grants, he has been awarded an Australian Postgraduate Award, Curtin Research Scholarship, and Early Career Development Fellowship. From 1990 to 2010, Thor managed a group of companies providing research and media services to the building and construction industry in the Southeast Asia and Western Australia. As the managing director of BCI SCA Singapore based holding company, he shifted industry discourse in Southeast Asia towards green building and ethical construction practices. And he was also involved in planning, costing, designing, supervising, and delivering research subscription services, publications, and consultancy projects for thousands of clients, corporations, and institutions. He founded BCI's Indonesia subsidiary and served as its commissioner until 2021. And he, uh, Thor has also worked as a researcher, journalist, editor, and document specialist in Melbourne, Jakarta, and The Hague. He worked for the Jakarta Post as a copy editor in the 1990s, and he is now currently researching the temporal and spatial scales in media representations about carbon emissions and energy production. And I personally am so proud to have Thorker as my thesis supervisor while, while I'm undertaking my master's degree in professional writing and publishing at Kirkland University. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Thorker to deliver his talk. Hi, Thor. Hello. How are you? Uh, good, hey. thank you. Good. Thank you for hey. the um, generous introduction, Rebecca, and thank you to the committee um, of Chuachi for inviting me um, here today. Um, so sodara sodara yang te hormat. I'll I'll make a start. I'll just open my um, screen, and I'll show some PowerPoint slides. So um, let me just open this up. Okay. 
And Rebecca, perhaps let me know if you can see those slides. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, it's good now, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my talk today will be on submarine cables between Indonesia and Australia with the themes of rebound, connect and grow. So these submarine cables, um, which today are very big business and very important for communications, the, the video feed that we're um, engaged in today, this video interaction, the data, most of the data, if not all the data that's producing the sound and um, and the video image is running through undersea cables. Um, and you can find these undersea cables, they go back a long way, they go back until the um, late um, latter part of the 19th century. And if you're lucky at low tide in various parts of um, the world or even Indonesia and Australia, you might find these cables. Um, what I'm holding here are these cables that were laid um, about 120 years ago from Cottesloe out to the Cocos Islands, so across the Indian Ocean. And um, a century ago, telegraph signals used to travel down these cables. But this was the start, if you like, these early cables that ran between um, Australia and Indonesia were really part of the, the first um, worldwide electronic communications network, if we think about it. So coming into the pandemic, um, and for, we were fortunate coming into the pandemic that there'd been a big increase in um, undersea cable uh, capacity. So the latest cable to be laid between Perth and Jakarta, which may be supporting this communica our communication today, was the um, was the Indigo West cable, which added an extra 36 terabits per second of capacity um, to support this kind of level of video conferencing that we're, we're involved in. And this, could, this new cable came soon after a 60 terabit per second cable was added in late 2018. These cables are optical fiber cables and they have the impact of increasing, radically increasing the amount of data that can be transferred between um, Jakarta and Perth. And there were the, these upgrades in cable capacity were really the only major direct um, upgrades between um, Perth and Jakarta um, to be made in, in the, over the kind of the two de decade period leading into that. So the earlier cable that was laid between Jakarta and Perth uh, was laid back in 90 or became operational back in 1999, um, which was the CMEW3 cable. And that enabled me to actually start that business that um, Rebecca referred to. It enabled us to have an online internet based um, research business where we could deal with clients and researchers across Southeast Asia, Western Australia. Um, in a real-time mode. That was thanks really to, uh, to the CME We 3 cable and other cables. But if we think about capacity since the CME We 3 cable, we now have 6,000 times more capacity to communicate through undersea cable. Um, today in the world, about 97% of all international um, or intercontinental communication goes by undersea cable um, with the rest via uh, satellite. Okay, and the very first optical fiber cable to be laid between um, Western Australia and, and Jakarta or uh, West Java was the um, Jasuras uh, network, which had a tiny capacity compared to, today's, to, the, to today's capacity, but was very important nonetheless. <clears throat> so what I'm trying, hoping to show you is that there's been this development, if you like, um, in communications capacity between um, Western Australia and Jakarta that's really developed um, over the last 25 years. And it's really only been in the last five years that there's really been a leap in that capacity to enable the sort of video conferencing that we're doing today. So the question really for us today coming as we emerge, hopefully emerge from COVID-19 crisis is, what does the future rebound look like for submarine cables between Indonesia and Australia? And, and I think this is an important question because it can enable um, business uh, or people engaged in cultural activities or business to think about um, how these communication systems might work and not just communication systems, but also um, electric systems. 
So back when the first networks were laid, um, it wasn't just a, these, these networks essentially relied on electricity being run under the sea um, to send signals. So we're in a situation today where we can use cables, uh, undersea cables, either for communications, for optical fiber networks, or for uh, transferring power and electricity between um, islands and continents. Okay, so the future rebound, what does that look like? And there's been a lot of moves in um, over the last year, or year or two, to really uh, radically increase the capacity of cables and also to think about the networks in slightly different ways. So the, the main player in the undersea cable laying space in Indonesia is a company called Moratelindo. Uh, it's under Cinemas Group. And it's just been commissioned or was recently commissioned to build um, a, the Indonesian leg, or if you like, the Indonesia-Singapore leg of the Hawaii Nui cable, which is a, a very high capacity um, cable that will run from Los Angeles or runs from Los Angeles uh, down to uh, Melbourne in Australia and across to um, South Island of New Zealand. But there's a connection that you can see on this image that will run um, across to Darwin and then um, through Indonesia, through East Indonesia, West Indonesia, and up to Singapore. And the company that's been commissioned to, to get the permits and lay the cable is a company called Moratalindo. Moratalindo has already laid about 45,000 kilometers of cable in Indonesia. There are very few companies in the world that have the capacity that Moratalindo has. And, um, it has really demonstrated its abilities in this sector by laying the Palapa Ring uh, West and Palapa Ring East. So if you're communicating perhaps from Jakarta um, through to Singapore, you may well be running, um, the data may well be running through um, part of, or is likely to run through part of Moratilindo's network that it laid and operated. So within the cable space, we see um, companies emerging, uh, Indonesian companies with very strong technical capacity um, and cable production and laying capacity. Um, in other parts of the Indian Ocean region, you have to look to somewhere like India to Tata Communications to see this kind of um, capacity in operating networks. But I don't, I don't believe they have even the capacity that Moratilindo has to actually um, lay cable. So Moratilindo is emerging as uh, as a national player in this space, but also potentially as an international player. So that was in telecommunications or and internet traffic. Um, the other interesting thing in undersea ca cables that's happening today is there's a project called um, Sun Cable. And it's a project that, that really starts with a, a giant solar farm in the Northern Territory, in a, in a desert area, if you like, um, producing power, uh, electricity there, transmitting it through or well, moving it through a set of transmission lines to Darwin to power the city of Darwin. Um, but what is expected to happen or the plan is that over time um, there will be increasing, um, increasingly large solar farms that can potentially not just power Darwin, um, but that power could be sent via undersea cable through to Singapore, where um, the plan is from Sun Cable to power 15% of Singapore's um, electricity supply. This project has some serious investors. This would be by far the longest um, electricity undersea transmission cable in the world. It would be about, I think, eight times longer than the, the biggest one that's the longest one that's currently operating. So it's quite a, um, it's a very, very ambitious project. Um, but it does have some serious investment and some serious investors behind it, including the, uh, the owners of Atlassian Software Company and also um, from Western Australia, um, Mr. Forrest from Fortescue. So it has some serious billionaires behind this project, but it's a project that relies on um, technical and governmental uh, coordination and um, engagement with, with Indonesia. And I think for a system like this to work, it would... Um, you would expect there to be some form of um, local energy production sites to boost the, um, the transmission through East Indonesia through to Singapore. So this, this project, if you like, the Sun Cable project is probably at least um, well over 10 years away from um, 
become being realized at least the the network between darwin and singapore but having said that they've already started their oceanic surveys and um, have contracted companies to start working on planning the the laying of that cable so it's a serious project but it's also a fantastic project in terms of scale um, and to do something that hasn't been done before um, i'll just go back one slide to moritalindo and i should have mentioned one thing i should have mentioned is that Moritalindo is a company that's growing very fast. I believe it's just publicly listed. And it's really growing in response to a close to 50% increase in the amount of data um, traveling through Indonesia's internal network. So I think the Ministry of, Communica you know, Ministry of Communication Information um, of the Republic of Indonesia stated that the amount of internal the data traffic reached 39.7 petabytes um, in May last year, and that was up 50% on the prior year. So this is an, a, a really a high growth area, particularly for a domestic a company in Indonesia. Okay, back to PowerLink. So what's interesting for me about the PowerLink project, it's, it is really ambitious, but if we think back to where this all started, the first undersea cable connection between Australia and Indonesia was also um, equally ambitious. It was a link that was, um, or a cable that was laid in 1871 from Banyuwangi out to Darwin. Um, it's a cable that had a lot of trouble due to um, undersea geological shifts and um, volcanic activity. Um, it's often broken. Um, and it was a cable that was replaced um, a couple of decades later by a connection from Banyuwangi in East Java down to Broome, which is a cable that I've had, or at least this has been an opportunity for me to study um, this, this part of the network. Um, what's interesting if we think about the, these kind of projects, either the Moritalindo Hawaki Nui project or the um, Sun Asia Cable project, is that they, they use the same kind of language um, in talking up their projects that was used, um, you know, 100 and, you know, 150 years ago, essentially, uh, which was basically to build these, these networks for the future. Um, so the thinking at the network level, or at least within the, the, the corporate level, um, to, to make these networks and the connections, if you like, between government and corporations, such as the old Eastern and Associated Telegraph companies, um, hasn't changed that much since that time. And we can, we can trace some similarities between those. So if we think about the submarine, um, the submarine cable sector and how it might grow, um, there are many challenges to be, to be negotiated. It's, it's an exciting space. It's an important space to, to work in. Um, there are issues around technology transfer. Um, so for a company like Moritalindo to, to succeed, it must invent its own technology, plus also adopt um, existing and license existing technologies. It has to work with international partners. Um, it has to deal with technological risks um, and undersea volcanic risks. It has to deal with um, trawler, uh, trawlers, uh, nets and anchors being kind of torn through cables, which has been a really a major problem since 1999 in, in, in Indonesian waters, or at least between Indonesia and other countries. Um, the other challenges really in this space are working with the cable laying giants and the globalizations of sponsor states. So I think we need to, to when we think about these sectors, we have to have our eyes open to those big, broad geopolitical tensions that are emerging and um, have emerged really over the last couple of decades in the world. And these, these tensions have much more kind of cultural, bigger cultural and historical um, threads that, that run through them. So if we look at the four big undersea cable laying uh, companies in the world today, these are the these four companies, ASN from Europe, NEC from Japan, Subcom from the United States and, and HMN, um, which was formerly known as Huawei Marine Networks, or, or today it's really Hengtong from, from China. These are the only four companies that um, have the capacity at the moment to lay um, international cable in the, Indian, in, the, in the Indian Ocean, or at least in the last um, 10 years, these are the only companies to have laid cable in the Indian Ocean in the last 10 years. Um, all of them have some kind of connection with big power. So we think about um, um, ASN or Alcatel, it really goes back to that 
first network, the 1870s uh, network um, that I showed you on that chart before with that Banyuwangi Darwin connection. It has its origins um, in terms of producing cable on the, the banks of the Thames River in London and those factories that produce the technical equipment uh, still operate on the, you know, on those Thames River sites. So this is ASN as a company that goes back to the you know, 18, 1860s in London. NEC from Japan, um, which has always enjoyed a relationship with, um, with the US techn technology companies. Um, but it's very much a company that grew with the growth of Japanese empire from, say, 1895 um, with the annexation of Taiwan through to, you know, World War II um, and its um, occupation of Indonesia. So and NEC was involved in the, the process of, you know, expansion of Japanese empire somewhat reluctantly. And as it looks back on its history, it, it sees it as a disruptive period and a period that wasn't good for the company. But nonetheless, um, communications and empire, unfortunately, um, do go together. Um, Subcom um, also has a, you know, a, a close link to US power, um, US military communications as well in the United States. There's no escaping that for these big companies. Um, and also we've seen um, with HMN from China, um, which has really grown, grown up in the last 20 years with the expansion of Chinese cyberspace and networks throughout the world. Um, and, and also is kind of accused of being in, involved um, you know, in, in state espionage and things like that. So these companies, it's a difficult space because um, these companies are operating internationally and they're operating increasingly within a competing globalization for different forms of globalizations. Um, so for companies in Indonesia or perhaps um, a company like Moritalindo, these sort of spaces need to be, and these kind of tensions need to be negotiated very carefully. Um, in order to, you know, to, to, to bring the kind of technological development that um, Indonesia is looking for. Um, there are also big cultural challenges and some of the work that I've been doing with colleagues in, in, in Indonesia is to look at the different social imaginaries around submarine cable networks. Because in order to understand how um, these, these tensions that are, that are in the world at the moment, how they're negotiated, we really need to understand how different communities think about submarine cable, submarine cable networks, um, and international issues and international partnerships. So this takes me um, back to some research that I had, I had an opportunity to do with my colleague at um, Universitas Erlanga, Dr. Ifan, Ifan Wahudi, and by chance back in 2019, just as COVID-19 was emerging but hadn't yet closed borders, we had a chance to, to research how the people in the town of Broome in Western Australia and in the um, city of um, Banyuwangi, how they remembered or didn't remember these, this old cable network that ran from Banyuwangi to Broome. And this was really a key leg, if you like, in the international, in a worldwide network that ran right around the world from London to London, uh, running through um, Southeast Asia through East Java to Broome through Australia and then across the Pacific. So we want to really look at how the very first electronic communication nodes are remembered today and how our cables are understood. Were they good things? Were they bad things? Or they, have they just been forgotten? So what we're trying to do is to get beyond narratives of connection and disruption to understand the significance of submarine cables. So Starting in Broome, if you land at Broome Airport, and perhaps hopefully some of the alumni has had a chance to do this, um, but if, you, if you're in the airport terminal, the very first bit of signage you're gonna see, uh, a bit of advertising you're going to see is an ad for Cable Beach Club um, and perhaps an ad for the shuttle service, which gives you two choices. You can either go to the town of Broome or to Cable Beach, which is a, which is a, a resort area today. Now, Cable Beach um, is on Yawuru uh, country. Um, if you go to Cable Beach, um, you're not, at the moment, you're not likely to see much reference to um, Yawuru language or this being, a, you know, an indigenous place, which is, um, which is what it is and what it will always be. But that's being changed over time now. So there's some efforts going uh, underway in Broome to rethink um, 
Cable Beach as being um, an indigenous place, as, as, as existing before the cable was laid, if you like, and having um, language and other references um, emerge um, in that place so that people can see that it's more than just Cable Beach. Having said that, Cable Beach is, is deeply embedded in the, um, in the social memory in Broome. It's remembered fondly uh, um, by people with um, Indigenous heritage, but also with Malay heritage or Indonesian heritage. Um, Broome is a very interesting city because back in 1905, or at least according, according to Sally Bin Demon, whose book I'm showing here, um, she grew up, um, or at least people grew up in Broome, often speaking um, a version of Malay called Broome Malay, and that was a street language because it was such a mixed community and there were so many um, Perla workers um, that had been recruited through Singapore and also Kupang, um, and a lot of Javanese people had um, come to, to Broome to work in those industries, but also had come to Broome to work in the telegraph industry, as I will show you in a little while. So in Broome, when they think about the cable, um, there is a, a public memory, if you like, of the cable and the connection to Java. So if I read from tw page 23 of Ben Denham's book, she would say, sometimes we would head out to the white stretch of coast known as Cable Beach. It got its name from the communication cable that ran from Broome to Java in Indonesia. We'd make a day camp just below the cliff edge that gently fell away down to the beach, take a big canvas sheet, hang it on long poles for shade, we usually had the whole 14 miles of pristine white sand and glistening turquoise water to ourselves. So Cable Beach is remembered fondly, um, but also that connection to Java um, as being part of that. Um, there's a kind of fondness around that, um, that connection also in Broome. Um, within the Broome Museum, um, there's a whole section on communication and you can see a little piece of the cable there, the old um, Banyuwangi Broome cable. Um, at the top of screen. Um, and Broome is a city that really um, takes pride in its involvement in international communications from the electronic uh, submarine cable telegraph um, through to coastal radio. It's also a town that um, hosted the Australia's first um, indigenous uh, tele uh, radio station and it has a very significant indigenous television station in Galari Media. It's also perhaps Australia's most successful, it's also the city or town that hosts Australia's most successful indigenous publisher um, with books like Dark Emu, which has you know, gone on to sell well over 100,000 copies. So it's a town, it's perhaps, I can't think of a town in Australia that's more successful in terms of its contribu contribution to media from print to electronic to radio, television. So we have to kind of wonder why, why this Broome has this kind of heritage um, and, why, and why, how this has emerged. We know that it was a very cosmopolitan um, town and we know that part of, the, part of that came from the pearling industry and part of the, um, the migration into, into Broome, if you like, came because of the telegraph station. So when we look at public signage around um, Broome and public statements and plaques, we'll often see uh, knights and lords, um, business leaders remembered. They're typically English or perhaps um, Anglo-West Australians. They're remembered in history. Um, so we take this uh, caption from Susan Sickett's book. Um, if we look at this picture, we'll see that Miss Fountain, Mr. Fountain, Mrs. Fountain, Bishop Trower, um, were all referred to in this picture. Um, but it also, the caption also says, the names of the rest of the men, staff and servants were not recorded. So often we'll find that um, people who worked on the cable station um, were not remembered in history, at least in, in public history and public reference in the city of Broome. We have to go to historians to find that kind of information, but without too much effort, um, managed to discover that the person with a circle around him um, is Mayuki from Java, and he spent 22 years in Broome in various roles, including working at the cable station. So we can see these, these, these connections um, to people who've contributed to the, the development of communications between um, Australia and Indonesia. Um, these references appear, and this image appears uh, many times in, in Broome. We found it many places. Um, but Mayuki's name is never remembered, unfortunately. So 
This is the back of the telegraph station. It's what the building looks like today. Um, at the other end of the connection um, in Banyuwangi, we wanted to look and compare and see how that station was remembered. And in 2019, late in December 2019, this is what the cable station looks like um, in Banyuwangi. It's in a very prime location next to the city square within um, an old um, fort, if you like, that was used by the um, British trading companies, but also then by the Dutch, um, but also by the Dutch and during the war, World War II by the Japanese. It's a place that's used as a site for filming horror movies today um, and or horror documentary, particularly around some of the atrocities that happened in World War II. Um, the only reference we can find that gestures towards this being a telegraph station um, really is the, the manhole cover that we're looking at there, which was produced in, in London. And under this manhole cover, evidently, this is where the cables ran into the, into the cable station in Banyuwangi. The cable ran down um, Boom Beach, um, and this is looking out to Bali. It's quite a pristine um, image. This is a site that's remembered for tourism and can be found in uh, magazines, but there'll be no mention of the undersea cable or the connection to Western Australia um, in any of these references. We don't find any public reference to Western Australia um, on site. There is a group called Banyuwangi Tempo Dulu with 28,000 members that collects um, heritage about Banyuwangi. And within their archive, um, Ifan found a couple of photographs from the Australian National Art Archives, which uh, create some understanding that there was some kind of connection with Australia, but you have to work really, really hard to find that connection. Um, having said that, there is interest in recreating and, and understanding um, how this site in Banyuwangi was connected with the Broom site. So there is a desire, and we found that in local media because I picked up on the research that we were doing and ran stories about it. Um, here are a few references, but the, the thing I want to talk about and finish on after that survey is we came away with a, an understanding that the network in the, if you like, the first international electronic connection between Australia and Java, it's, it's remembered very fondly on the Australian side. Um, Banyuwangi is mentioned, so people in Broome know about Banyuwangi um, and they know about that undersea cable. They may have forgotten the names um, of the workers, um, but somehow there's this legacy of cosmopolitanism in Broome um, and cosmopolitan media, including in indigenous media. There's fantastic stuff going on in media in Broome. On the Banyuwangi side, we find that there is really no memory um, of the connection to, to Broome um, beyond specialist archaeologists who, who research on the site. Um, there's certainly no public recollection of that. So with the post-colonial movement and independence, this, these very old connections have been forgotten. And there's a risk in that for Indonesia because um, in the 1920s, when Japanese were doing research on, on Java, they found that Java was the key site of telecommunications equipment production um, in the world. It was perhaps beyond outside of the US, um, the US and Europe, perhaps the biggest site of telecommunications manufacture was Java. So in a way, in forgetting its colonial heritage, um, perhaps um, people in Java have also forgotten the contributions by Javanese people to the development of communications technology. So one of the things we'd like to do is to, is to relook at some of that history um, and create some engagement between um, the, you know, the, the cable laying that's going on at the present and um, the production manufacturing around telecommunications equipment that's occurring in Java and think about reconnecting it to some of this really early history where Java was a key site in the world for the manufacture of telecommunications equipment. So thank you for your time and I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Thor, for the very insightful talk. I myself cannot imagine that communication that we thought has been very simple, just clicking on our telephone or on mobile phone or on internet or a laptop, is actually having such a complicated engineering under the sea. And we are so grateful that we have this connection established between Australia and um, Indonesia, especially Java. And thank you so much for highlighting the history of all this uh, that is happening from Banyuwangi to Kabul Beach. I cannot uh, wait to visit Kabul Beach myself in Brook <laughs> if I have the chance. And also, 
it's interesting to know that there is also Broome Malay, the street language used just because there are many Indonesian people coming to Broome to work for the constructions. And we see how connection is established during all this um, construction going on. Also, the relationship has been there historically. Thank you so much once again for, for, for the insightful um, talk. And Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to ask questions. So after this one, um, I apologize, I forgot to mention because I'm too excited for today's professional development. So after Thor, there will be um, Bapak Tuk Bagus Salihuddin PhD. We'll spend the next 30 minutes for the uh, talk, the second talk. And after that, we will have 30 minutes of question and answer, Q&A. And we welcome all of you, Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, please. If you have any other questions about um, the talk today, please you can uh, type it in Slido. Or if you would like to ask our speakers personally, um, kindly, patiently wait until the Q&A sessions. And we really encourage you to welcome you to have an open discussion with our speakers today. All right, I think without further ado, um, we will uh, welcome our second speakers today, Bapak Tubagus Salihuddin. So Pak Tubagus Salihuddin, or we uh, sometimes call him Pak TB, is uh, currently working at the Research for Climate and Atmospheric Center Research Organization for Earth Sciences and Mar Maritime National Research and Innovation Agency of Green. He completed his PhD from Department of Applied Geology at Curtin University, Western Australia. And he is also one of our um, recipients of Australia Alumni Grant Scheme or AGS in 2021. Patu Bagus is an avid scholar. He has over 30 publications in international peer review journals, over 100 citations by 105 documents with Asian Nook of Six. Uh, I believe Thor especially know how important this is because <laughs> we have been talking about this research publication uh, so many, many times. And then his research grant, I think uh, for Patu Bagus, the most current one is the one from Green for fiscal year 2020-2020, number six. Uh, it's about model of Chitarum watershed management for mitigating coastal degradation and water security. And he has multiple grants uh, to conduct his research. And some of his latest publications include carbon sequestration potential in the rehabilitated mangroves in Indonesia, Ecological Research uh, published this year. And currently, Pak Tubagus is presenting far from Balitung, from the Western part of Indonesia, because he is also, while uh, giving his speech, uh, giving his talk for all, to all of us, he is also conducting his research with print. So Pak Tubagus Salihuddin, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, thank Pak, so the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you, Mbak Rebecca. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank to uh, Chuachi Summit uh, the Committee for, especially for Mr. President, Mas Heri. Thank you for inviting me to share uh, our uh, development project under alumni grant scheme uh, in 2020, in 2022. So hopefully uh, it can motivate uh, or uh, stimulate uh, as well as encourage uh, the other alumni to participate in the uh, community development project in Indonesia. So, uh, I will operate my uh, presentation. Okay, so can I share a PowerPoint? Okay. All right. So today uh, I'm going to talk about water management for water security in the densely populated small island. So the project uh, is funded by the Australian government through Australian alumni, Grand Sim, and administrative administrated by Australia Awards in Indonesia. So the project itself has just finished two months ago in June uh, 2022. Okay, uh, the outline of this presentation include background, uh, objectives, key message, project site, method, result, and conclusion. So uh, the background of the project 
are uh, small islands. First, small islands have limited groundwater resource due to small catchment area, as you can see here, the small island profile. So this is the small island and this is the sea. So the, the catchment area just only this small exposure, the green one. Okay, secondly, the threats of loss or degradation of groundwater resource due to excessive use. And third, uh, threats from climate related change such as El Nino, which will considerably disrupt groundwater reserve in small islands. And for nearby island, Polo Panjang has experienced seawater intrusion into dug wells atau sumur gali at four kampung or four village. So the idea is, uh, the idea of this project is uh, to prevent, to prevent Tunda Island becoming uh, uh, as a big, uh, to prevent uh, Tunda Island from groundwater uh, from degradation of groundwater, such as nearby island of Pulau Panjang. Okay. So the objective uh, of the project include. Uh, knowledge and technology transfer on how to assess and characterize the potency of groundwater resource in small islands and project the water demand in the near future. And second, uh, raising public awareness on the importance of sustainable groundwater resource and implementation of conservation-based water management. And third, public advocating for pre-preparation of the integrated rainwater harvesting and artificial research system or abbreviated by ira -Hals. So the, the, the key message to be delivered in this project, so not only sent, but also delivered of this project uh, include sustainable groundwater resource on small islands are essential for, for humans and livelihood. Second, shifting paradigm. This is more importantly, shifting paradigm in water security investment from a top-down investment toward a bottom-up development strategy. Third, environmental and socioeconomic benefits of conserving groundwater resource and preventing the loss or degradation of water resource in small island. So uh, this is the project site, uh, Tunda Island, uh, located offshore of Banten Bay. Serang Regency, Banten Province. If we look at this map, this is Tunda Island. It's about 26 kilometers away or 15 nautical miles from the mainland. And this is Panjang Island, close to the mainland. And to the east is Ribu Island, uh, Jakarta. Okay, the total area of Tunda Island is about 206, uh, 276 hectare. And the total population is 1,500 in 2021. And the population density is 543.5% per kilometer. Okay, uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. So the population and uh, water demand. As I mentioned before, the population of Tunda Island in 2021 is 1,500 with the percentage of uh, population growth around 4%. So with this simple formula, I cal uh, we calculate the, the water demand uh, up to 2030. So based on uh, percentage of population growth per 4% and 60 liter per percent uh, per day water need, this is based on uh, UNESCO minimum standard. So uh, based on this, uh, we calculate the population in Tunda Island in 2030 will be 2,135, and the water demand uh, in 2030 will be 46,700, uh, 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 more than 46,000 meter cubic per year. Okay, so this is the rainfall and the hydrology condition of Tunda Island. Uh, in, the, in this uh, graphic, this is the average rainfall of Tunda Island based on climate data from 1979 to 20, 2012, so, uh, probably like uh, 30, 33 years data. 
So based on this data, we make this graphic. So uh, from January to May, in Tunda Island, is categorized as moderate monthly rainfall from June to September, categorized as low uh, monthly rainfall, and from October to December, categorized as moderate monthly rainfall. So based on uh, this data, we calculate the annual average rainfall intensity, we calculate the FR4 transpiration, we calculate the water runoff, annual average air temperature, water balance, and also we uh, measure the month of water deficit, June to October with total 225 millimeter, and months of water surplus from January to May and November to December with total 466 millimeter. So this is the uh, graphic of water balance based on uh, rainfall pattern data and FA4 transpiration data. So based on this graphic, we can see here, this is from June to October. Uh, this is the months of water deficit. So from June to October, Tunda Island experience water deficit. Next, okay. Uh, this is the geomorphology of Tunda Island. Uh, so the Tunda Island is reef island. Reef island is terumbu karang. Uh, in Indonesia, we call it terumbu karang. So with the elevation uh, up to 12 meter based on dam data, this, this is the Tunda Island. And the geology of the Tunda Island uh, composed of quaternary river limestone. So in, in Indonesia, we call it also uh, batu kapur. Yeah, batu kapur. And uh, the hydrology of the Tunda Island, so the aquifer system, uh, include fissures, fractures, and dissolution. In Indonesia, we call it melalui celahan, melalui rekahan, dan melalui pelarutan. Okay, the product, the productivity of the aquifers, aquifer system is small, kecil, and the transmit transmissivity mean uh, ke pen, kepenerusan ya bahasa Indonesia nya uh, from low to high with debit less than 10 liter per second. So this uh, okay. So the land cover, the land cover of Tunda Island, uh, composed of vegetation. This is the dominant one. Uh, cover almost more than six, uh, 86 percent. The open land cover nine percent, and the settlement only cover four, more than four percent, and paddy field cover half percent. Okay. So yeah, uh, I would like to say that this data is very important when uh, we are going to uh, transfer the knowledge and technology to the local people. So we, ho we, uh, we have to understand, we have to understand the characteristic of the island so that we can uh, transfer the knowledge, the knowledge thoroughly and comprehensively. So, okay. So uh, this, uh, we move on to the methodology. So I think it's better for me to show you uh, met, uh, met the methodology both in figure and video, uh, just to make it more informative and uh, yeah, more live. Okay, so the first methodology is interview community participatory. Also, okay, so uh, the best thing for the community development project is how to build the uh, how to build closely engagement with the local people that's very important in indonesia we call it ngopi ngopi yeah this is like like this okay so i i will play the video misalnya air yang berlebih saat hujan itu kita tampung terus kemudian lebihnya itu kita injeksi ke dalam tanah gitu supaya pak supaya tidak jadi air air yang melimpas langsung ke laut gitu. masukkan ke dalam tanah itu akan akan mengisi tuh mengisi merecharge ya mengisi kembali gitu Okay, can you uh, can you hear the sound of the video? Yeah, the sound is okay. The sound is okay. Okay. Thank you, okay. okay, next to the next slide. Oh, oh, sorry. So the next methodology is water table measurement. So the basically this is the measurement of the water elevation, water elevation uh, from the top, from the ground. So this is the video. I'll show you. Okay. 
Oke. Okay. Next, uh, recovery debit measurement. So basically, this is uh, how to measure to calculate the debit recovery of the dug well atau sumur gali ya, sumur gali. So debit alamnya sumur gali. So uh, the, this is uh, basically we empty the dug well, empty the dug well, and then we uh, measure how long does it take for the dug well for the sumur gali uh, back to the normal elevation. So and we have to do this at night because uh, this is uh, this need you know uh, no people use the water so so that we can we can get the nature natural debit from the dark well okay i will show you the video so this is the dark well the sumur gali and then we empty the sumur gali using the pump and then after Uh, the dark well empty we calculate how long does it take for the water uh, back to normal so that that's the idea of the recovery debit measurement it it took uh, like five hours so we start from 11 p.m until 4 a.m okay Next, uh, water quality measurement using a uh, water quality checker. So this is the video. Oh, nih, ya. oh, lebih rendah, kan? yeah. Oke, okay, so next methodology is mini workshop. So after we uh, conduct uh, uh, what uh, what uh, collecting data, after we collect uh, the primary data uh, in the island, so we conduct a mini workshop, mini workshop one. Uh, as you can see in this video ada interaksi antara air uh, tawar ada air payau kemudian ada salt water salt water itu air garam ya seperti itu jadi kalau air tawar ini kita sedot terus menerus ini berarti salt water sama salt waternya akan naik jadi zona biru ini akan akan semakin berkurang sini Kemudian terus berkurang sini. Semakin banyak kita ambil air fresh waternya, air tawarnya, air. ini air garam sama air payau yang akan naik ke atas, gitu. Nah, kalau di sini permuka apa di permukaan? Oke. Okay. And this is next to the next methodology. Oh ya, yeah, ini mini workshop tuh. This is video. the last methodology focus uh, group discussion which held in uh, Serang in May 2022 so this is the video uh, perkenalkan dulu ya mungkin sebagian ada yang kenal mungkin ada yang belum saya kade 10 panjang di Pura Bukis uh, saya tinggal di Pulau Panjang Pak kebetulan ini sesuai dengan apa yang hari ini dibahas mengenai air karena pulau panjang di sini sebagian ada di sini ada tujuh kampung pak tujuh kampung itu ada tiga kampung yang airnya tawar 
Jadi mungkin uh, itu yang agak jauh dari pesisir laut. Yang lain dari yang empat kampung itu semuanya asing. Oke, okay. so we move to the result section. So based on the physical and chemical water quality measurement, we get this data: acidity, salinity, temperature, turbidity, dissolved organic matter, and chlorophyll A. I don't think I have to uh, mention all these things. So, okay, uh, we also uh, analyze the water sample in the lab for potable wet for potable water. And this is the result of the analysis. And okay, we go to the success story. So the project is not only delivered oriented, but it may improve the capacity and behavior change of the targeted group as evidenced from the pre and post test interview and testimony from the community members. And also, there was one interesting statement from the Kepala Desa of Tunda Island during the mini workshop. He said that until uh, you guys come here, we never know since we were born that our water resources will be gone if we don't apply wise water use and management. <laughs> and then uh, third, the project has uh, driven various response and appreciation from many stakeholders especially from the local government and direct uh, beneficiaries. Okay, next. Uh, the challenge that we face during the uh, project. So first, not all community members were aware of the benefit of sustainable water management on the small island. And second, not all community members agreed on the urgency of the implementation of conservation-based water management in small island. And third, not all community members are able to construct irahars or integrated rainwater harvesting and artificial recharge independently, even on a small scale or household scale. As we can see here, this is the household scale of uh, irahars or integrated rainwater harvesting. So this is the, the roof and this is the tank. So when, when the rain come into the roof and then it will go to the this small channel and then uh, after that uh, the, the the water go to the pipe and then go to the uh, tank and overflow from this tank go to the uh, ground uh, masuk ke dalam tanah ya uh, to to the uh, to the dug well okay uh, okay we come to the end of this presentation uh, conclusion so uh, groundwater potential Groundwater potential is still sufficient for household domestic needs. It needs wise management for its use. Second, water quality is still suitable for cons consumption after proper cooking. And conservation-based water management is needed in line with population growth and tourism development. The content of E. coli bacteria is high because the distance between the septic tank and the residence well is too close. So mostly uh, the distance from the uh, septic tank to the dug well is three meter to three to five meters. It's too close. So, and then irahars or integrated rainwater harvesting can be used to cover demand in water deficit months from June to October. And last but not least, other irahars benefits for flood control, water reserves in the dry season, preventing land subsidence, preventing seawater intrusion, and controlling groundwater level decline. Uh, this is just only the, <coughs> the example of the uh, rainwater harvesting application in Tunda Island. And this is the uh, profile of the artificial recharge. Okay, thank you. Back to you, uh, Ibu Rebecca. Thank you so much, Pak Tubagus. It's really an insightful and it's actually a thought, I believe it's a thought-provoking um, projects that you have been conducting. It gets me to realize that sometimes water is one of the many things that we have in life that actually we have taken for granted. I, I, I'm sure some of us, if not all, agree. And I, I, I remember Wiseman say that you never appreciate what you have until it's gone. And I hope water, fresh water, especially that we really need for our basic uh, necessity, will not gone. Uh, only if we implement the right 
or the correct management. And we are especially thankful to Pak Tubagus, Solihudin, and team for conducting this project uh, to um, introduce Ear Hearts to uh, the community in Tunda Island. And I believe, I hope we can extend this, um, not maybe not the project, but the mindset of managing water uh, wisely in our daily life. Thank you so much, Pak Tubagus, Solihudin, for the inspiring talk. You're and welcome. we again we welcome Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any, I believe you have maybe a lot of questions to uh, both of our speakers, Tore and Pak Please, uh, you can uh, put it in the slide deal. And okay, I think that will be all for the speakers. Uh, before we go to the Q and A sessions, can we give a round of applause to our co-worker and also Pak Tubagus? Thank you very very much for enlightening us with this. Um, impactful and powerful talk. And so are we ready for the Q&A? Yeah, can we start? Okay, awesome. So we have some questions in coming uh, in Slido. So, okay, so all this question goes to both uh, Thor and also Pak Bagus. So I think we start from the first one. The first question is for Thor. And I think after that we can go maybe like back and forth, back and forth, if you don't mind, yeah, okay. All right, so for third, the first question is, great presentation, Dr. Kerr. How long can the submarine cable last in the ocean? And how are usually the cables damaged? Okay, um, thanks, Rebecca. Um, cables can last in the ocean for, 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 for decades. Um, going back to the very early history of cables, they um, would last only months um, until a latex was developed in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, and Indonesia or Dutch East Indies back then um, using a, a product called gutta percha, which is um, from um, a kind of rubber tree. Um, and once this was wrapped around the cables, the cables could then last for, for years or decades. So in a way we wouldn't have the first international um, or worldwide telecommunications network had it not been for, for latex from um, Southeast Asia, from Indonesia. Um, so that's that's another really interesting fact about Indonesia. Um, what was the other question? Sorry. The next question, I think, is about the damage. Um, okay, yeah, because okay. these, these, these are related. So the the cables now will last. I mean, they may. I mean, they will last a very very long time now, like decades and decades, unless they're damaged. Most of the breaks come from. Um, well, traditionally, most of the breaks, at least in the last 20, 20 years or so, have come from uh, fishing trawlers. Um, when they're dragging the big nets along the ground, um, they often tear through cables. So there are laws around cable laying, for instance, that um, when they're within a few kilometres of the shore, they're then meant to be um, a certain depth under the, under the seabed. But out in the open sea, they're, they're exposed and they're often running across some of the, the the very big gorges, undersea gorges, they're totally exposed. So an anchor can just, or a, um, something from a fishing vessel can just tear through that. So that's the most common form of damage, um, followed by um, tectonic plate shifts and um, volcanic activity. So we saw, I think it was in the Pacific about a year ago, a huge volcano, undersea volcano goes off and it, and it destroys the communications network for, for several weeks, um, if not months, and it takes a while to repair. Um, which gets me to the repair part. So there are these um, cable ships that are stationed, and I think there's there's one almost permanently stationed in Singapore that can go out. Um, they basically go out, drop down a like a hook-like device, pull up the cable, or they, and then basically repair it and cut it, re-splice it on deck and repair it. So there are sensors along the undersea cables, which um, are basically like sending out an electric signal. Um, and it enables the cable companies to understand where the break is. So they, they identify the location of the break, they sail the ship out there, um, it goes down, retrieves the cable from under, they lifts it up, and basically they repair it. Um, and traditionally, they've always repaired these things on, on, on deck. And it's a bit like just traditionally splicing a, well, at least traditionally it's like splicing a wire. It's more complicated because it's, it's fiber optic. Um, but that's essentially what happens. But it can take several days or weeks for the ships to get to the location of the break um, to retrieve the cable and then and then fix it. Right. Thank you so much. And I think uh, could you please show the question again? Yeah, because it brings us to the next questions. Uh, because uh, that was what happened in the repair uh, these days in in today's era. What about when it happens in eighteen hundreds when it was first completed? So, mm -hmm. what are some threats to the submarine cables, and how about fishing activities? 
Okay, I, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I haven't heard of fishing activities back then because fishing was more line fishing um, and nets. There weren't the heavy um, anchors and attachments to the, the big trawler nets. So the, the cables were often only buried as they came onto the sand or onto the beach or just before they came onto the beach, like those cables that I showed you earlier, the Cottesloe cables at the start of my slides. So um, they were often only buried um, as they got close to shore because there wasn't, and there wasn't really anything by way of fishing activity that would tear through them back then. It was more, um, uh, to, you know, the big risk was really geological shifting um, and a cable would snap. Um, but I think, no, but it's an interesting question. I, I need to do more research to find out if there were fishing, you know, breaks caused by fishing back then, but I haven't come across any in the documents I've seen so far. Okay, all right, nice. Thank you so much, Thor. It's, it's really glad to know that there is a way to fix it. Otherwise, I don't know, I cannot imagine if we don't have any internet connection for it's only like a minute or two. <laughs> and it's nice to know that all the technology has enabled all this development. Thank you so much, Thor. And I think we're moving on to the next question, sets of question for Bapak Tubagus Salihuddin. Thank you. So the first question, um, thank you, Bapak Tubagus. Great AGS project in Pulau Tengah. What were the stakeholders that you engage in the project and any challenges coordinating with them? Hey, thank you for the question. So uh, we uh, we involve like Spentahelix stakeholder. First is a non uh, non government organization, and then local government, central government, uh, private sector, scholar, and also the uh, the community itself. So because there are there are two uh, community uh, community in Tunda Tunda Island, they call it uh, kompak kompak is kelompok masyarakat uh, konservasi penggiat konservasi so like conservation group in in Tunda Island and the second is uh, kelompok, uh, kelompok masyarakat pengawas so yeah kelompok masyarakat so we in, uh, we closely engage with this uh, with this uh, uh, community members and the challenge uh, as i mentioned in in my presentation so not all community member are aware uh, the important or the essential of the sustainable groundwater uh, resource and not all community member also even uh, agree agree that the the implementation of the conservation based water management uh, is essential in in their island and uh, and also the challenge is uh, so not all community member are able to construct or to make the Iraha system even in a small scale in, in, in front of their house. So need uh, help from the local government, from the private sector, from the central government, and from, from uh, many stakeholders uh, to uh, together uh, to help the people to prevent the cost, uh, the groundwater degradation in that island because based on uh, experience, uh, in the nearby island, the as Ibu Ratu said in the video, that from seven villages in the island, four villages has been contaminated with the seawater yeah. instruction. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, that's yeah. it uh, for yeah. the first question. Uh, okay. Second question. Thank you so much, Pak Tubagus. And yes. the next question will be. Yeah, I think that the second is there. So I think we go to the third one. Uh, how long the water in Pulau Tunda will last with current climate change issues? At some time, the dry season is longer than the wet season. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, I haven't calculated yet because this uh, is very, compli very complicated if we relate it to the uh, climate change issue. I know that uh, I, 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 we already calculate the <clears throat> based on the climate uh, data as I uh, as I sh uh, show you in the presentation, so like uh, from June to October is mo uh, our months uh, of uh, water deficit in the island. But uh, as we as we mentioned also in the uh, presentation, and we calculate as well that the water, the groundwater potency in the island still enough for domestic use, and 
I, we already also uh, measure for one dug well, yeah, untuk satu sumur gali is still enough for 10 to 20 people a day. Yeah, I think uh, this is this good news that the water, the groundwater potency in the island is still good. But I don't know for the next five years, for the next 10 years, with the population growth, with the climate change issue, with the uh, development of the tourism in the island because because the island uh, has been developed uh, uh, has been developed by the local government as a fishing port and a marine tourism and diving center so we don't know yet uh, what will be happen in the next 5 years or 10 years but uh, for this time being the potency the groundwater potency in this island is still enough for domestic use we already calculate uh, uh, all of this I think, yeah, that's that's my question. Uh, that's my answer. Thank you so much for the business. It it um, we feel lucky that we still have water, especially those in Tunda for the next five years. Hopefully, with the more advanced technology that we will like extending to 10, 15, 20 years even. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patu Bagus. And do we have any more, any other questions or any uh, anyone from the audience would like to ask directly? Oh, we still have one. All right. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I think we're back to Thor first. So we have another three questions. Uh, Dr. Kerr, what do you think will happen if Indonesian company fails to work with other global companies that you mentioned on the slide? It's a really interesting question. I think there, there, there are many, there are those four big companies to choose from, or, or essentially, I guess, there's three big players in the world that um, you could go to. So you look how different countries at different times relied with um, different cable laying companies. So um, so like the BRICS, com BRICS countries um, are aligning very much with the um, HMN or the, the Hengtong Huawei uh, cable laying companies, and that's giving them a space. There's now a cable running between South America out of Brazil and Africa, which is fairly new cable. Um, but those kind of opportunities to align um, with with China through the through the the, the BRICS countries already doing it, um, Australia often is kind of negotiating between our local companies like Telstra between we're typically using um, Subcom the Americans which re reflects that kind of a traditional American alliance and um, but but occasionally you'll see an operator use the ASN European network as well, so I think Indonesia Indonesian companies have a choice they can work out whether they want to collaborate with all these um, companies. And um, Morita Lindo has a, has a background of working in and around network that's been laid by um, basically all these companies. Um, the early Palapa ring network was laid by HMN or, or Huawei, um, but also Indonesia has connections coming in from the ASN networks and the um, subcom networks. So Indonesia is actually in a very good position to choose. You know, it can, it can go with different partners at different times. Um, which follows kind of the national government's policy as well. So it, what the mistake would be to perhaps work with without a partner, but perhaps Moritilindo will one day develop the capacity that it can, it can be an international player and build cables, say, from Australia to Indonesia without the need for an international partner. Um, and that Huaki Nui cable network, if that is laid um, by Moritilindo, it, it already demonstrates that it can lay cable between Indonesia, Singapore and Australia. So... Indonesia is well on its way to being um, to kind of a, a cable sovereignty, if we think that way, cabling sovereignty. Nice, good, it's really nice to hear. Okay, um, thank you, Thor, for the for the answer. And then moving on to the next one, how do you see Australia telco business performance at the moment? Uh, I think it's really, really strong. I think. Traditionally, Indonesia's played a, a leadership role in, you know, in the development of communications networks from radio, the early radio aerial out of Bandung, which enabled um, kind of worldwide radio um, uh, signals to be to be relayed from the Netherlands to, to Indonesia. That was thanks to um, Indonesian technicians. Um, so I think technically and maybe culturally, Indonesia is in a kind of a leading position to um, to be a to perform well in this sector so and i think there's been a lot of initiative in networks um really even since the new orders time where, where you see a lot of innovations in indonesia so i, I would say 
Indonesia is in a really good position. As Australia, it's a bit different. We tend to rely on um, on international um, partnerships and subcontractors a, a lot more. Um, Telstra is doing has has really had to withdraw from its quite a dominant position back in say nineteen late nineteen nineties. Um, and had to rethink how it how it does things domestically and internationally, but it's still the biggest player. The second biggest player here is Optus, which is owned by Singapore Telcom. So we've already, in a, in a way, a, a third of our market, if you like, is um, is being developed um, under under Singaporean leadership. So our satellite systems and our um, cable internal cable networks are very much. Um, already done through international partnerships through Optus um, and then through other players as well. So we're very internationally open, but we tend to work with traditional colonial partners such as such as Singapore. So you see that Singapore connection, 150 years, it hasn't it hasn't gone away. It's still our um, Australia's strongest telecommunication partner. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we will go to the next question. Hi, Dr. Thor. What is the biggest problem in Indonesia for the submarine people? Uh, I think it's vo undersea volcanoes by far, and and fishing trawlers. I think it's um, improved its its fishing regulation, so it may not have as much trouble um, with that. And also, the networks are being buried deeper now, so the undersea cables tend to get buried deeper as part of the regulate regulatory environment. So, I think it's really undersea vo volcanoes will be the biggest risk. There's also also the the tensions around the South China Sea um, issue, which um, we're not, you know, hopefully that's not an issue and Indonesia could, uh, governmentally can negotiate that. And it seems that the Indonesian government's very sophisticated about how it's going about these kind of negotiations around those South China Sea tensions. So they're the two, two big risks, undersea volcanoes and um, geopolitical risk. Um, you know, from between the basically between the the US um, and, and the China alliance and those tensions, Indonesia is in the middle of that and um, much more than other countries. Okay, and yeah. hopefully we'll not get caught in the tension. Yeah, you know, exactly. I think Indonesia will, will negotiate through. I really, we, I think the world, the whole world needs to, you know, Indonesia's leadership on this. So we're really, I'm very happy that Indonesia has a very sophisticated government for dealing with this kind of issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thor. And I think we have one last question for Thor. Um, yeah. So, Dr. Thor Kerr, how the comparison between internet connection provided by the undersea cable with the internet connection provided by the satellites from Buirina? Okay. I'm going to speak from personal experience for Rina. Um, back in 2000, 1999-2000, when we um, set up that, um, it was basically an information company. Um, and we had a lot of we had hundreds of Indonesian subscribers accessing a service, uh, accessing a host servers in um, Singapore, and there was a connection was broken between the cable, the undersea cable was broken, and even though it only had a fraction of the capacity that networks have today, um, all of our communications had to switch to, net to, to satellite. So even a um, you know one sentence coming down by that satellite feed, say one sentence of data, would take maybe a minute. So effectively, it was it was useless. We couldn't do this video call via satellite. We couldn't do um, move sound and images. We maybe just some very basic data can move through that system. So it, it's a backup, but. Um, it's it's a very poor backup. The the there are having said that there are companies looking to um, and I think I think Tesla might be one of them. They're looking to basically launch small box size satellites, like thousands and thousands of small satellites, um, which would be I think closer to, to Earth as well. And then those could be used to to transmit data via satellite. So there are companies working on um, ways to to launch satellites very quickly to um, for use when um, undersea cable net when cable networks go down and as alternatives maybe in um, in security situations and things like that so there, there are still moves to improve satellite technology for communications but there is no way we could do what we're doing now purely by um, satellite unless all, you know all the capacity of the satellite was booked just for this call say mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the uh, all the comments and discussions. And I think we're moving on to pa to Bagus now. Okay. We have additional four questions. I didn't mind. 
The first is I heard that in some islands, the water is contaminated with seawater. How do, how do people in these areas usually get the water? Okay. Okay, thank you. So for the daily needs, they, uh, such as for taking a shower and for washing a cloth, they need the saline water. And for, for potable water, for drink water, uh, they uh, buy uh, like air gallon, mm. uh, yeah. So uh, and also some of them move from the coastal area to the mid uh, to to the middle of the island, which the which the uh, groundwater is still good. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Second. Yep. Second okay. question. Second question. Uh, Pak Tubagus, will the recovery time differ during the day or the night? Oh, uh, yes, of course, yes, yeah, because during the day, uh, people use the water, and uh, but at night, people sleeping, <laughs> and then uh, the the water, the recovery water will will be more natural. Of course, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, that's why we conduct the recovery uh, debit measurement at night from 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. to 4 a.m. just to avoid uh, <clears throat> people use the water so mm -hmm. that we, we get the natural debit recovery. Yeah. yeah. Nice. You stay awake when everyone is asleep. That's really nice. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Such a powerful dedication. Thank you so much, Pa and team. Yeah. And the next question, Pa Tubagus, what is the ideal distance between the septic tank and the well? Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, I refer to the... Uh, Public Works Minister of Public Works and Housing, so it's at least ten meter, uh, yeah. the distance between uh, the well and the uh, and the septic tank. So I I, I just refer from the uh, Ministry for uh, Public uh, Public Work and Housing. Yeah. Okay. And um, Pat Bagus, can you briefly share what paradigm shift you are expecting from the community where your project take place? Did you see any change at the end? Well, okay. So uh, we haven't uh, seen yet the impact. Yeah, the impact uh, such as well the 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 community. So the community construct or build uh, themselves the irahar system uh, in their house. We haven't seen yet until up to now, because yes, there are so many uh, there are so many challenges uh, uh, as I mentioned. But uh, the idea of this project is to build the uh, collective awareness of the people of the island people, uh, uh, how essential of the groundwater resources in their island. So at least we got behavior change. So mm -hmm. at least they are aware, they are aware and they implement, uh, implement to reduce the water usage and also to implement the uh, conservation based water management yeah. further. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember in one of your slides, uh, it's written that the head of the village of Tunda mentioned if you and your team didn't come to the village, that they will not be aware that yes. water yeah. actually can be depleted, can be exhausted. Yes, and exactly. I think it's yes. one of the it, it's one of the awareness that has been raised yes, exactly, uh, by yes. Patu Bagus and team uh, yeah. at least to the kepala desa to the head of the village. Yes, that's yeah, really exactly. awesome, Pak. Yeah, yeah, that's one change that we need to see. Yeah, and he can that's... influence all the villagers hopefully. Yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. So to to build awesome. the collective awareness of the right. islands. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so I think we still have one more question. One question to left. Mm -hmm. Um, Pak Tubagus, what do you think about distillation technology for small islands? This one is from Pak Ramnan. Well, this is Pak Ramnan is my colleague. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, probably uh, uh, I will not answer in this uh, event uh, because uh, Pak Ramnan is my colleague in my office, so probably I will discuss it uh, okay. in, uh, with Pak Ramnan, uh, Bu Rebecca. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Pat. Okay. Yeah. Uh, will that be all? Or do we still have any more questions left? That will be all. Okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Thorker and Pat Tubagus Salahuddin. Thank you very much for your time and for letting us tap into your wealth of knowledge. We can see that, if I may sum up, water and connection or cable connection or internet communications. That's two things that 
actually now has been the most important change that we need. And sometimes we take it for granted because we don't realize how complicated it is to build from the very start. But now we see that how it all can make us connect. And so that by connecting, we can grow. And by grow, we will be able to rebound from all the problems that we done. So thank you so much once more for Dr. Torker and Pak Tubagus Salahuddin. Thank you so much for being with us. All right, thank you so much, Materi. Thank you so much, everyone. And don't go yet, just yet, because we still have um, fun activities. We have business pitching. We have annual general meeting, and also we have quiz with especially um, interesting gifts for all of you who want. <laughs> okay, but first of all, allow me to, um, again, I extend my gratitude to Dr. Doctor and also Patu Dr. Salyudin for your inspiring talk today. We will be very happy if you can uh, stay with us until the end of this um, session, but we also realize that you might have um, uh, something to do for this weekend. So please stay so salty, it's on me. Alrighty, so thank you so much for attending the first talk session of this day, of this event. And now I'm virtually handing over this mic to the next session. Thank you.